Hey, welcome back Design Squad and in this video is gonna be a special one and it's gonna be 1000 subscriber special. Really big thanks to you. It seems like Q&A and different questions just kept piling in and I just decided to answer a few of them. There is one specific request in the video. It's gonna be tough I think because just knowing how many of those explosions there have been in the past. Boom, boom, so boom, and boom. Now it's boom. Boom, 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 and boom, my files, and boom, I boom. Pretty good, but boom. And uh, yeah, let's see what happens. So I have a few questions from Twitter followers, some from Quora, some from just a YouTube channel. I'm gonna give it maybe a minute or two per question, and let's see what we'll get with that. Some of the questions are quite serious, some of them are quite easy to answer. First one is from Elvis, and he's asking, hey, what type of education what type of schooling or experience has led you to UX design? Well, my personal journey was quite simple. I always knew that digital and tech and something to do with creativity is gonna be the place where I'm gonna put you know, all the eggs in that basket and I'm gonna develop there. Then I started studying multimedia design and communication, which was a mixture of business communication, arts and digital design and you know, multimedia production. I knew that user experience is gonna be where I'm gonna be at because it was just a hint of it. And you know, at that point it was still developing and that was you know, over a decade ago where everybody were just kind of tinkering here and there and user experience was not really like a highly in demand profession. Everyone was doing UI design or web design. I then got my web development degree and then proceeded from there, but I kind of developed through let's say UI design, web design, a bit of web development and then you know user psychology and just kind of expanded on that and then got into UX design as I am now today. The next question is from Sarah and I read it before and I had a thought of it already and I think I'm gonna answer it in a separate video which she's saying this might be a bit heavier than you're looking for but wondering about your thoughts on age bias in the field especially when it comes to men versus women. While design certainly is a new the field we work in has evolved significantly. In recent years and with boot camps and fast track UX programs the talent base seems to be trending younger and younger. Do you think professions 40 plus will continue to find their place as design practitioners? And I really do, Sarah. I, I can't really address the men versus women issue or you know the distribution of people in the field because it really depends. Let's see, my team is primarily women and only a few are men, and it's quite a big design team. And you know, the more mature the design organization or organization it's part of, the more women you're gonna encounter in the field. But specifically about the age, there is a part of self limit thing but there's a part also a part of the ageism and, and you know bias which you are think coming from from technology to kind of go for the cutting edge and fast-paced and you know with generally younger crowd you, you don't really see that many older let's say UXers or designers or researchers because we usually move on in the ranks so we usually are more into let's say the actual direction there is a lot of product managers who started as designers and they just kind of move on if you're 40 i would assume you have decades of knowledge in different fields and in different industries and so you become more valuable as you go at least in my head we usually become much more valuable to our organizations as we age because we have that treasure throw for our material which where we can you know produce new ideas and improve but it really depends what environment you're in and there's always going to be people who just you know limit those things or we have a bias against older generations. Uh, next question is from O Helen and she says favorite part of your job. I think generally UX design is really challenging. You always see all those nice mock-ups and layouts or solutions but it's only like the icing on a cake. Usually there's a lot of different hard work and a lot of different tasks which went in into making it happen. I think that's what people tend to overlook. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, and that's why the favorite job would be to arrive at a destination or, or get positive feedback from the users or get, produce big impact basically if you know the tiniest details because in UX the tiniest details are actually what matters most and what delivers most value for business and the end users. And so that's probably the best when you kind of like validate your different assumptions, your hypotheses, uh, you put something in place, you learn a lot from it, and then you adapt, adjust. But I think that aha moment is what's the most, uh, you know, the most interesting bit, and as well as pays well. So 
that too. Next question is from Camille and he's saying, how do you approach to ROI of your UX work? How do you measure it? It always depends on where you're at. From UX standpoint, I usually try to set the KPIs and success factors in place. Uh, meaning, you know, talking to stakeholders, product managers, product owners to actually know exactly what are we after. Is it customer engagement? Is it conversion rates? Is it cost reduction for the business? Knowing that you always set some sort of KPIs in place and these are the ones which are, we are going to track, you know, throughout the project and we make changes and produce different experiences. The ROI is really hard to calculate for the new things. It's usually easiest when you have to improve something because you already have the KPIs at the place, ideally. And so you use those analytics to then make some sort of hypothesis saying that if we do this, then this is going to improve because of X. You can always assume and predict what could happen based on best practices. You need to declare a confidence of it because you never know how it's going to be you know, taken, what sort of things are going to be implemented on time. And so it's really hard to predict. And next question is from Sophia. Uh, which is your favorite tool, Sketch versus Axure? Uh, Sketch for mockups, Axure for high fidelity prototyping, Principle for micro interactions prototyping, and you know, all the animations and all that jazz. Real time board or Miro, as known now, for you know, collaboration group activities and all that. Nelson asks, should you, UI UX designers work directly with a product owner? The answer is yes. The higher up you can go, the better it is for everyone. Business, UX designers, because you get ownership, you get exposure to the actual issues, you get to contribute to get buy-in directly, you don't have to go through advocates and middlemen, so you get an access to the actual decision makers. And so yes, it's so much easier than, for example, myself, if I work with someone for, with my UX team, let's say, and product owners, to get their buy-in before it's too late. And so you can always collaborate and initiate discussions and validate things early on and then progress that way. So yes, definitely. Next and last one by Nick, one of the YouTubers who leaves a lot of comments. Thanks a lot for that, by the way. Often our compositions can get real complex and the code statements long and difficult to track. Have you found any ways to create reusable components that can be added to a library and used to create more complex solutions? That might be a good subject, maybe titled interactive library. I think that's great, Nick. Um, I think it's almost like a request I'm gonna take on board and make it actionable because I'm planning to produce maybe 10, 12, 15 episode uh, session of how to make design asset library or design system. So I'm gonna use the previously discussed in one of the videos, Atomic Design Systems, as well as the tools we already use, and then make a quick framework and walk you through A to Z of how to make an easy living design system where the patterns have to be maintained and easily transferred from one stage to the other, from you know the simplest atoms, the tiniest bits into the molecular organisms like forms and tables and templates and actual solution pages. And so I'm gonna walk you through A to Z. So stay tuned for that. This is a really good shout out and I'm glad I could plug in the next bit which I'm working on behind the scenes. So stay tuned for that. And so this finalizes and sums up my answers for your questions. Thank you so much who contributed and asked those questions. I received so many more. These are just, you know, bits here and there. If you like these type of Q&As or you have a big question, just shout out. I'm going to try to answer it and make different videos doing so. Or you usually leave a comments down below on any of the videos if you like them, if you want me to continue on these things and if you have any special requests. So thank you so much and let's do another thousand or actually 10,000. So thanks a lot guys and see you next time.